broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Kelly Eversole, and I'd like to welcome you to a Phytobiomes Alliance uh, informational webinar. Uh, and today we have with us Meredith Ashby from Pacific Biosciences, who's going to be talking about unbiased, efficient characterization of meadow genome functions with PacBio HiPi sequencing. But before we get started, I'd like to kind of explain a little bit about the what phytobiomes are and about the Phytobiomes Alliance. Um, Kelly, can you uh, share your screen? Oh, you can Maybe. see the screen. Under the sharing tab, there should be a big play button. There we go. Is it on now? Yeah. Yep. Beautiful. Okay. Um, so we are a nonprofit consortium of industry, academic, and governmental scientists. And our goal is to build a foundation for site-specific phytobiome-based enhancement of sustainable food feed and fiber production. Within that, a lot of people have been confused about what we mean by phytobiomes or made assumptions. But in essence, we think of plant-based agriculture as a very complex system. It is a phytobiome. And by that, we really mean a plant in a site-specific environment, the plant in a particular area. And that includes all of the microbiome and the various microbiomes, the plant, as well as the soil microbiomes, all of the microorganisms uh, within that, as well as all the macroorganisms and macrofauna. It also includes the arthropods, other animals and plants that may be in that specific environment, as well as climate, weather, and water, and even uh, water that might be uh, uh, added, such as irrigation, for example. And to uh, for us to begin to understand that entire complex system, we also have to take into consideration management practices, which would include nutrients, uh, might include biologicals that may be added uh, to beef up the health of the soil or to accelerate the development of the plant or even to increase the uptake of nitrogen in the plant. So within the Phytobiomes Alliance, our vision is that by 2050, all farmers will have the ability to use predictive and prescriptive analytics based on geophysical and biological conditions for determining the best combination of crops, management practices, and inputs for a specific field in a given year. And to get there, we need to pull all of these components together and increase our understanding of the entire phytobiome system and really build up for next generation precision agriculture. And within those, if you think of these four uh, balloons, so to speak, that are feeding into the our knowledge of phytobiomes, we have the macroorganisms, which we, we have quite a bit of understanding of what plant genetics are doing and how they're impacting um, productivity. We also have quite a bit of knowledge about general management practices, whether that be uh, crop rotation practices, nutrition, uh, nutrient um, in, uh, additions, or even soil amendments, etc. We also have quite a bit of information and knowledge about the physical environment itself where we've had we've got almost 70 years of weather data on a number of different uh, levels that is available where we don't have a lot of information because the science has not been really robust enough or cost effective enough enough for us to get information is in the area of the microbiomes and really beginning to understand that. So that's become really a focus point for the Phytobiomes Alliance. And the reason, one of the main reasons that we are holding this webinar is that we'd like to see increased investment and increased research in the area of the microbiome. So with that, I'd like to introduce uh, Meredith Ashby, who's the Director of Market Strategy for Microbial Genomics at Pacific Bio. 
She completed her PhD at Caltech, mapping the gene regulatory networks that direct sea urchin development, just as the sea urchin genome was being sequenced. She was inspired by the impact of genome sequencing on her research and, and therefore joined PacBio after a postdoc at University of California, San Francisco. She's been with PacBio since 2009 and has worked in R&D on both sequencing optimization and bioinformatics application development. And right now she's focused on facilitating the use of PacBio long read sequencing to solve the unmet needs of scientists seeking to understand the incredibly diverse range of microbes that live in, on, and around us in the systems we depend on. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Meredith and uh, she will give you a short presentation about what PacBio can do. Hi, Kelly. Thanks so much for that really kind introduction. Uh, I think I myself just learned quite a lot about phytobiomes uh, listening to your, your description of the challenge. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, so as Kelly uh, noted, I, uh, I'm here to tell you specifically about uh, what PacBio can do uh, for researchers who are interested in getting uh, a deeper understanding of, of metagenomes in particular. Um, so uh, this is a, an exciting field, and uh, until recently, uh, there has not been a lot of progress, um, but with the uh, changes in the throughput of both NGS and long read technologies, uh, we're starting to see a lot more insights coming, um, coming forward. Um, but there's still quite a few challenges uh, that, that remain. And I think the biggest one can be summarized as so far there's been a lot of sequencing, but there's not uh, a lot of fully defined metabolic pathways. And this is true both for um, you know, human microbiomes, but also uh, particular for environmental examples as well. And, and what, is, what are the things that are really slowing our progress? So one of the big challenges that researchers face is that DNA extraction methods uh, introduce bias, uh, the differences between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria, and what is required to open them up is, is very well known. Um, and another challenge is that, that people might not be so aware of is uh, the challenge of assembly. So uh, right now, most uh, efforts to understand microbiome or metagenome data depend on assembly, either to increase the contiguity to the point where you can do gene binding or for error correction, uh, such that you can correct the errors uh, by making consensus sequencing. And both of these methods are very data inefficient. Um, and I think uh, a statistic that really drove that home for me was understanding that with typical short read metagenome assembly, anywhere between 30 to as high as 70% of the data cannot be backed up to the assembly that's made. And, and that's simply because of the inefficiency of this, of this process. And as it happens, the more complex your system, uh, the higher the loss of data. Uh, so one question that people have been asking is, do we have all the data types that we really need to understand metagenomes? And people are answering that in a number of ways. So for one, uh, one solution I've seen recently is people looking at spatial aspects of metagenomes, trying to retain that spatial information uh, such that they can better understand which microbes interact with each other uh, within a system. Another um, direction that has been fruitful recently is metabolomics or proteomics, looking at what compounds are actively being made so that you can understand what parts of the metagenome are under active expression and use. And then finally, of course, there's long read sequencing. And uh, since I'm from PacBio, you can probably guess which one of those uh, new data types I'm gonna be talking to you about. Uh, so with PacBio, we uh, have our most recent system. Uh, it's called the SQL system. And this is a very high throughput system that allows high resolution of uh, metagenome data. And we have uh, three different applications that you can run on the SQL system, or at least we like to think of it as being three different applications. The first, of course, is full-length 16S sequencing. Because of our long reads, uh, we don't have to choose which region of the 16S gene we want to sequence. You can sequence the whole thing. 
Uh, and the key utility of folate 16 s is to identify uh, what species are present. And to use this uh, approach on a PACFIRE system, you can either use our protocol or you can make use of an all-in-one kit uh, from our partner, Shoreline Biome. A second application is uh, Hi-Fi shotgun profiling. And so this is just, it's just shot shotgun sequencing, but the difference between uh, how we do shotgun and how other technologies shotgun is that we can, uh, we can do a CCS sequencing, which allows us to get um, reads up to 10 KB in length that are highly accurate, just as accurate as short read sequences. And I'll go into more detail about that in a moment. Uh, and the great thing about this is that those reads, since they are so long and accurate, you can use them directly uh, for gene discovery without doing assembly. And so we like to think of um, genome assembly then as a third and distinct uh, application that can be run on the SQL system. So metagenome assembly from long reads allows you to generate uh, new references, metagenome assembled genomes or MAGs, uh, for microbes that can't be easily cultured. Uh, and in addition, you can leverage the epigenetic genomic data that's gathered during the normal course of sequencing to cluster contigs and plasmids that come from the same host organism. So how do we, how do we generate high accuracy and long reads at the same time? Uh, so the PacBio system has uh, works by sequencing these smart bells. So the smart bell is made by adding these hairpin adapters on either side of a linear piece of DNA. And once that's on the instrument, uh, the enzyme begins to sequence and it opens that up into a, a circle. And we can sequence around the circle over and over many, many times. And when you combine uh, each of those subreads, each of those passes to generate a single highly, uh, single consensus sequence, what you get is a read that has very high accuracy, which we call a high fi read. And as you can see over to the right, uh, it doesn't take that many passes in order for the next accuracy uh, to be very high. And our average read rates on the SQL2 system are up to 90,000 uh, reads and, and higher. And as a result, we can sequence uh, both 16S or shotgun reads uh, in very long chunks and, and get to very high accuracy with those reads. So what does that mean for metagenomics? So I'm going to show you some example data that we generated in-house, uh, and then um, and then after that I will go into some use cases showing how scientists have been able to use that data uh, to better understand complex communities. So in this example here, you have um, three different uh, runs uh, showing full-length 16S sequencing on mock communities. So these are uh, mock communities from ATCC that are either uh, staggered um, or uh, even. And you can see in both cases, there's a large number of reads. And once you filter those reads uh, to be greater than 99% accurate or higher, you can see that the average uh, quality value there is very, very high. So for this example, Q42 means 99.99% accurate or higher. Uh, and we're able to multiplex at a very high level here uh, with the average number of reads per barcode um, as, you, as you see below are off to the right. Um, the nice thing about our, our data set is that while of course you do have to do PCR to, to, get the, um, to get the 16S amplicons, once the template is on the instrument, no additional amplification occurs. And what that means is that with PacBio 16S, you're able to fairly faithfully uh, recapitulate the species that are present in your sample. And so here we're comparing on the left the expected values from the MSA 1002 mock community, and on the right, the actual results uh, from PAC biosequencing. And in addition, the results are, are very consistent. Uh, so this is an example of uh, 32 of the 48 uh, runs, uh, all multiplexed together from the MSA 1009 staggered mock community, and you can see that the results are very consistent across all of those wells. Moving on to uh, shotgun performance, you can see that sequencing performance on the SQL2 system, and this is, is, um, is very robust and gives you a lot of data. Uh, so this is, these are ru nine runs of human SQL samples using our uh, new chemistry, version 2.0 chemistry, which just came out 
uh, this October. Uh, and you can see in this case, you have um, on, on average well over 2 million reads, and each one of those reads is over 8 KB in length on average. Similarly, when you filter at Q20, you see that the average accuracy of those reads is well over 99.9%. And the thing that I always like to point out here is that if you look at this combination of average lead, read length and quality values, uh, this actually outperforms many metagenome assembly quality metrics. So our hi-fi reads are already as contiguous as most metagenome assemblies. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can download this uh, example data set yourself by going to our, our website. Uh, so the uh, other thing that I, since I, I also mentioned that the PAC biosystem does not do any PCR amplification on the instrument, and that is even more powerful when you look at the results of HiFi uh, sequencing. So in green, bars, you see the abundance of the staggered ATCC mock community expected. And then in purple, you have the results from 16S sequencing on the PAC bio system. And you'll see that the green and the purple track pretty closely uh, until you get to the lower abundance values. And then you start to see uh, this, this fall off. Um, but if you look at the abundance calculated from the high fi shotgun, reads, you'll note that the blue bars continue to track well with the green bars all the way across, and that any discrepancies you see do not correlate with the GC uh, abundance. And that's a characteristic of PacBio data um, that's been shown over and over again in our work in plant genome sequencing, which you may be familiar with. And that quality allows us to pick up regions of the genome, or in this case, the metagenome, uh, that are often missed by technologies that rely on, on PCR. So what does it mean that we have these long reads that are highly accurate? So it, it means that you can do gene discovery directly on those reads without having to rely on assembly. So in this example, uh, we took three human fecal uh, data sets and we did amino acid prediction and gene finding on these using FRAG gene scan. And what you'll note is that in each one of these cases, there was an average of six to eight genes uh, per read. And the advantage of that is that complete genes can just be found even from species that don't have enough coverage for assembly or error correction. And typically when you do assembly or error correction, you need about 30-fold coverage in order to uh, hit uh, that number where you can get to either reasonable contiguity or high accuracy. Um, but in the case of the packed bio data, that's not necessary. And so if you have any data at all from your uh, 1 or 0.1 percent abundant community member, the chances are you will be able to find intact genes from that data. Another advantage of this is that you, it means you can use whatever existing NGS tools and pipelines that you already use to analyze your metagenome assemblies without any modification. Um, so, on the other hand, if you really do want to assemble, and there's a lot of um, a lot of advantages to assembling even the hi-fi reads, it's true, or maybe you specifically are looking to create metagenome assembled genomes, uh, that works really well as well. Um, here you can see we've now assembled these three different samples uh, to get uh, a range of contigs, uh, and that these assemblies have uh, quite high contig N50. Uh, you can also further use a binning tool of your choice. Uh, for example, um, the RBS uh, binning service that's available from the Patrick website to generate high quality bins. Um, the interesting thing, if you look at these bins, is that you'll note that when uh, the PAC bio data creates a bin, it tends to either be um, high quality. And, and really blow that out of the park with very high coarse consistency or fine consistency and completeness, or um, it, it does not uh, hit it out of the park. And the reason for that in this case is that this particular um, bin, binning tool relies on the use of reference genomes in order to, to feed and create those bins and then find additional contigs that have high analogy to that, uh, uh, to that reference bin. 
That means that if you do not have um, a reference for your organism in your database that you're using to do this finning, uh, you're not going to get uh, as good statistics, right? And so what you're seeing here is that when PacBio, uh, with PacBio sequencing, if uh, the organisms uh, are in your sample that you're looking to bin are in your reference database, it's going to do a, a very good job uh, of binning those and, and giving you a very complete and accurate bin to work from. So now I want to shift gears a little bit and, and talk to you about a few use cases that researchers have, have published using PacBio. So as Kelly noted, um, uh, it's fairly recent that, PAC, that uh, the metagenome uh, scientists have been using PacBio uh, to start to do these types of analyses, and that's because the SQL2 system is really the first instrument that has allowed us um, to provide data at the scale um, and at the cost needed to approach some of the more complicated metagenome systems that folks that are studying phytobiomes are interested in. So not all of my examples are going to come um, from soil or plants, but you'll see as I go along that there are specific reasons why I chose these applications and why I think they are um, harbingers of the impressive things that you will be able to do uh, with environmental samples. So the first example comes from 16S sequencing. So we have a collaborator, Ben Callahan, who's the author of Dada2 software. And what Dada2 does is it analyzes 16S sequencing. And it's very popular software uh, for folks that are doing uh, V4 or other um, shorter 16S amplicon. Uh, so if, uh, if you will bear with me for a very brief biology lesson, <laughs> every bacteria, of course, has multiple copies of the 16S HAUPSCB gene. And the exact number of those copies varies by species. And the differences among these copies varies by strain. And what Ben Callahan found is that when he analyzed data from a mock community using Dada2, uh, our 16S data uh, was able to recover um, all the 16S communities from community members, not just an average sequence from each community members, but every exact copy. And that these 16S sequences appeared in integer ratios that reflected their copy number in each genome. So for example, Pseudomonas has four copies of the 16S gene and they are all exactly identical, whereas uh, E. coli has three copies that are identical and then four additional copies, each of which is slightly different from the other. And using this detailed information, he was actually able to unambiguously assign the strain in some cases where the database had that information. So in this case, he was able to tell uh, that the E. coli strain in the SMOC community was unambiguously 0157H7 based on NCBI, NCBI blast results. And this was uh, really eye-opening, both for him and for us, as it turns out, um, because there had been a rather uh, unflattering report out previously claiming that PacBio data was not accurate enough uh, to do 16S resolution. So in this, however, when when Ben reanalyzed uh, the data from this publication, what he found is that uh, the thing that the authors had thought was an error was actually uh, ground truth. So in the PEC bio data were five distinct uh, copies of the uh, 16S gene from Staph aureus, and they were different enough that when you try to average them together, it looks like systematic error. Um, but actually, that was because the short range genome assembly that was being used as the ground truth contained only one of the five RNA operons in the Staph aureus genome. And once they had the uh, more highly resolved information for PacBio, it became clear that it was actually the paper that was an error and not the data. And so uh, Beth thinks uh, there is a big opportunity here to further extend 16S software um, to do uh, tracking of strains by sequencing a 16S gene alone, or tracking the presence or absence or the consistent appearance of different strains in time points uh, from uh, the same sampling location. And so um, what that means is that basically when you use full-length 16S, this allows you to bring much higher resolution 
uh, to even complex environmental communities. So this example is from uh, the sequencing project that was done at uh, JGI, uh, looking at uh, the bacterial composition of the Saginaw Lake on the Sunshine Coast of British Columbia. And this is a, a meromictic lake that's rich in, in many different species. Uh, meromictic means that this lake has different layers of water which do not ever mix. Uh, and so the researchers took water samples from different lake depths and then did full length sequencing. And then they followed that up by uh, in silico carving out the V4 only sequences and then comparing what level of analyses and conclusions they would be able to draw with both of those data types. And what they found is that when you have full length sequencing, you are much better able and much more consistently able uh, to classify the species that you, uh, the organisms that you find down to the genus and even in many cases the species level. Whereas when you use only V4, uh, you can definitely get class and family, but the ability to classify the genus level or the species level uh, drops off quite a lot. And so according to the authors, full length sequences provide a more complete picture of community composition needed to accurately link microbial players with important biogeochemical cycles within a given ecosystem. Here's a, a more complete picture of the, of the data that they derive. Now what you can see here is that along the bottom, there are different phyla uh, that are listed. And then across the top, in each case, you have the analysis that could be done with V4 only, followed by, in a similar color, the analysis that can be done with full length. And so each one of these is a pair of data sets. And what you'll note is that um, with the long read sequencing, you were able to do unambiguous assignment um, at the genus level in many cases, whereas if you look at the examples that are boxed in gray, if you had only the V4, uh, that data did not make it onto this table uh, because it did not include genus level information. And you can see that multiple files were completely missed uh, if you rely only on the shorter sequences. And you can imagine how that might impact your ability to really understand who the important players are and what keystone species are present at each layer of, of that lake. So I'm gonna pivot now and move on to some examples of our uh, HiFi sequencing to do a metagenome discovery of both genes and then, um, and then uh, metagenome assembled genomes. So this is a really terrific collaboration that we did with the folks at Second Genome. So Second Genome is a pharmaceutical company who aims to identify novel therapeutics to address unmet needs by doing metagenome mining. And they uh, asked the question, can pack biosequencing enhance their pipeline for gene discovery? If their goal was to identify unique, complete, and error-free gene clusters, so the method that they used for this was to begin with HiFi sequencing, and then to use those HiFi reads uh, first to predict genes directly, but then to also assemble those reads into contigs. They then dereplicate the genes uh, that they find from the reads and map those onto the contigs that come uh, from the assembly. And in that way, they can do additional gene finding on the contigs. Uh, and understand the relationships among those genes. They also did some metagenome assembly. Uh, so this is an example of the assembly graph that you see, uh, the string graph. And so just to help you interpret this a little bit, every time there's a change in color in this string graph, you're moving to a different organism. And every time there's one of these intersections here, these star points, that means that the assembly graph cannot be further disambiguated, and that's where the assembly will be broken and shorter reads will be output. So the interesting thing about this assembly, and again, this is of a soil sample, is you'll note that in many cases, these contigs um, comprise the entirety or the near entirety of the species present in the sample. And in a few cases, for example, this Pseudomonas, and this um, Asinetobacter, uh, we were able to recover complete genomes uh, from, complete closed genomes uh, from this sample. 
Interestingly, in many cases, or we were also able to recover plasmid sequences, and in a few cases, these plasmids were also closed. So uh, the main finding from this uh, collaboration was that the HiFi reads uh, are a really great tool for doing gene discovery. And since they are both long and highly accurate, you don't actually have to do assembly in order to find those genes. So our partners used two different gene finding tools, Frag Gene Scan and Prodigal, uh, to do gene discovery on their sample. And what the, uh, the take home message here is that um, when you're determining community composition, so for example, true 60 mesh sequencing, the number of observations is what's going to drive saturation. But data contiguity is a more important driver than raw bases when you're doing gene finding. And that long reads allow the recovery of intact gene clusters that are going to produce bioactive small molecules, for example, antibiotic, uh, antibiotic resistance genes or antibiotics, um, even without assembly. And on top of that, the folks at uh, Second Genome told us that not only did, uh, were long reads more effective in finding genes, it was actually less expensive. Uh, and so here you have a table showing uh, the cost normalized uh, number of genes that can be recovered using either short or long read technology using one of the two gene finding tools that they found. And what you'll note is that HiFi uh, data recovers on average about twice as many uh, genes uh, as short read technology is able to do, even though um, more short read data was collected than long read data. So I'm gonna share now a second uh, example um, of gene finding and also metagenome assembly. So this relates to the cattle cow rumen. Um, so this is perhaps a little bit off the field uh, from uh, phytobio research, but I think that uh, you'll see why I brought it up as a, a very interesting example of what can be done to understand complex communities. So in this project, uh, the researchers were interested in understanding how short and long read technologies can compare uh, in assembling uh, the cow rumen microbiome. And in addition, how, how does adding high C linkage data add value to that assembly? And in this example, they used Illumina next seq sequencing, and then they used data from the PacBio RS2 um, and the SQL instrument. So the SQL is our previous uh, instrument, which was able to sequence 1 million uh, observations at a time, whereas the SQL 2 instrument is able to generate eight times as much data uh, with eight million sequencing models. And what you'll see here is that, as with genomes, uh, long ring data produces more contiguous assemblies uh, despite lower coverage. And so here you have the amount of data that was collected from Illumina versus PacBio. And what you'll note is the contiguity of the PacBio assembly is higher than that of the Illumina assembly. And that the contigs from the long read assembly were on average sevenfold longer. And again, as we, as we saw with the uh, second genome data, uh, this really increases your power for gene discovery. So as part of the study, they looked at the um, open reading frames uh, that they could find in both assemblies across a range of gene families. And what they found is that despite lower coverage, PacBio recovered significantly more antimicrobial resistance genes in the cow rumen than the short read assembly was able to do. Uh, and again, this is because gene finding really depends on contiguity. And these results actually contradict previous work that concluded that uh, feeding animals antibiotic concentrates did not lead to resistance. As you can see, uh, there uh, incidence of tetracycline resistance in the cow rumen is actually quite high if you use the right tool for the job. And then finally, um, when you add high C into this equation, the authors were able to discover uh, 188 novel viral host associations in the rumen microbial community. So as Kelly noted, uh, metagenomes are not just uh, bacteria, they are also viruses. In fungi as well. Uh, and 
adding this additional layer of data along with long read sequencing allow them to start to piece together how those viruses and the bacteria in that community interacted with each other. So the, in conclusion, um, the authors were able to find that layering in many different types of data and compositional methods uh, worked in a synergistic way to improve the characterization of the highly complex community. So for example, 16S is a really great way to see very rare species using a high throughput method, but using a full length method, you're able to better resolve the uh, community members at the species level. And then using genome sequencing, you can collect large amounts of data using the short read method, uh, which is, again, adds to your ability to do species identification. Um, but using long read data allows you to get better assemblies, which uh, perform better with gene finding and gene discovery. And then finally, they saw that adding proximity ligation can begin to link together all the extra chromosomal DNA that's occurring in a metagenome and start to untangle those important relationships. So the last topic I wanted to touch on here is metagenome assembled genomes. So PacBio metagenome data is able to provide a reference quality assemblies of unculturable strains. So again, this is a fairly new area for us. Um, now that we have the SQL2 system, we're able to generate the amount of data that's really required uh, to do a good job with this. But we have already a few use cases of customers doing this. So the first use case was presented at uh, just at, at ASM this past year. And it's an example of a researcher who wanted uh, to explore B. breve uh, present in the preterm neonate uh, gut microbiome samples. Because this bacteria has been shown uh, to be predictive of a good outcome uh, with preemies. Uh, B. breve is um, unique in that it can, is one of the species that is best able to convert human milk oligosaccharides into short chain fatty acids, uh, which basically feeds the gut microbiome. And um, what they were able to do is to assemble three distinct strains of B. breve from the metagenome data. And this was really significant because prior to this effort, there was not actually a reference available for B. breve, and now there are three. And here's another example that I think is perhaps more pertinent to um, phytobiome uh, research. This is a case where it was uh, found that you were able to do complete genome assembly of, of Wolbachia species uh, by sequencing the host Drosophila melaganogaster in this case. Uh, and so to do proof of concept for this, the researchers took three geographically dispersed strains of Drosophila and then sequenced those organisms and was able, and they were able to uh, develop completely closed um, genomes of three distinct Wolbachia strains. Um, and each of these strains had just uh, one contact and was a closed genome, high quality assembly. And the advantage of this is that Wolbachia is of course extremely difficult uh, to culture, it's impossible to culture. Uh, and in this way, you're able to do assemblies without any kind of experimental arrangement of the symbiont DNA or computational read filtering before you attempt assembly. You just assemble it all together with canoe in this case, uh, and, and it falls right out. So this is, of course, really exciting because endosymbionts are, of course, extremely important uh, to uh, complex systems, uh, not only um, are endosymbionts symbionts present in a wide range of insect hosts, but they also are present, of course, in things like um, root nodules um, and uh, other parts of plants. And this seems like a very promising way to start to get high quality genomes of these when they cannot be cultured. Okay, so I'm gonna pivot in a slightly different direction now um, and talk to you about microbial whole genome assembly of isolates. Um, so um, when you do a lot of metagenome sequencing, often it becomes the case that there are a few members of that community that you would really like to get closed genomes of or to study in more detail. Uh, and so one way to do that is if it's possible to, to culture and isolate those and sequence them. 
So then the question is, how much sequencing is enough, or how good of a genome uh, is good enough? And I think until fairly recently, most folks would say that a draft assembly is sufficient, or at the very least, was all that was affordable. And so I want to try to persuade you um, that we are now entering a new era of sequencing where the, cost, the high cost of having a draft genome uh, now exceeds the cost of finishing a genome with long-read sequencing uh, technology. So this is a recent paper that I, that I read from 2018, uh, wherein researchers were interested in understanding specifically um, what is the difference between what you can tell from a draft versus a closed genome. And so they went into NCBI and they decided to look at bacterioides genomes uh, because there were so many in there and because there's so many bacterioides and systems that, that um, humans care about. And they decided to look specifically at uh, Porphyromonas gingivalis strains. And what they found is and they took three of these draft strains and then they ordered those strains uh, and then resequenced them using PacBio to get closed genomes. And then they did annotations for both the draft and the closed genome and they compared the results. And what they found is when they were uh, attempting to, uh, to assemble the draft genomes with short read data, what they found is that the results were widely variable uh, depending on what assembly tool you used, and that oftentimes assembly tools that favored larger contigs were actually generating incorrect assemblies um, that had Franken proteins in them um, and in which the genes were not in the correct synthesis. Uh, and that Oftentimes, the genomes, assemblies that were better quality or more accurate had more contigs. And so this is, of course, a risk when all you have is a draft genome. You don't really know which of those drafts that you generate is the most accurate for your purpose. Um, and what they found, in addition, was that these draft genome misassemblies and truncations significantly compromised gene finding, and that the draft genomes tended to have more genes, actually, than the closed genomes, because those genes uh, were chopped into pieces and were not recognized as, as, as such. And then, and in addition, when you have the draft genome, a lot more of the discovered genomes were in the hypothetical category, and their function uh, could not be guessed at uh, by looking at the various domains that were present in the protein. Whereas with the closed genome, you're more likely to find complete genes and then be able to uh, recognize uh, the potential function uh, of, of that gene. And also, you're far more able to distinguish active genes uh, from pseudogenes, uh, which is often um, blurred or incorrectly annotated in the draft genomes. So in, in summary, the authors felt that closed genomes are really required to study a lot of the things um, that drive microbe, micro, um, microbial genome sequencing. You need them to accurately understand the metabolic capacity of your genome. Uh, you need them to be able to understand small phenotypic differences uh, between strains. Um, you need them to be able to look at horizontal gene transfer and to do comparative genomics in any meaningful way across closely related strains. So the good news is that getting a closed genome is less expensive than it ever has been with the SQL2 platform. Um, and the SQL2 platform is, is unique in that only PacBio is able to close microbial genomes with continuous accuracy across the entire length of that genome, uh, which is really required for robust genome adaptation. So um, I know a lot of you have probably experimented with using ONT for microbial genome sequencing, and you'll be familiar uh, with the requirement for Illumina data to do error correction in order to improve the gene finding from those genomes. Um, but something which is not perhaps well appreciated, is that the reason that Illumina data um, alone cannot close a genome is that a lot of those reads cannot be uniquely mapped to every area of the genome because of uh, ambiguous mapping. And if the Illumina data cannot be uniquely mapped across the entirety of the genome, that means error correction is not happening all around the entire genome. And there will always be regions of that genome that are not accurate. But with PacBio, you don't actually need to do hybrid sequencing. PacBio alone generates very highly accurate um, closed genomes. 
And it has just gotten both less expensive and easier to do than ever before. So just this fall, we have released more adapters to allow you to do higher multiplexing on the single tube system. And we have just uh, peeled out microbial assembly from the general larger genome assembly tool and established a dedicated microbial assembly tool in SmartLink 8.0 that allows you to do automated push button single technology assembly. So this assembly pipeline works very well for all uh, classes of bacteria, no matter what the level of genome complexity. And the way it does that is by, with the addition of a chimera detection and filtering module that goes through the data and removes likely chimeras before assembly is attempted. Um, and then we have added a plasmid sequence and recovery assembly stage. Uh, which is something you used to have to do on your own, but now it assembles first the chromosomes and then the plasmids. We've also changed um, our mapping tool that we use to do polishing to employ a circular aware polishing to make sure uh, that coverage stays high across the entire assembly when polishing. And then finally, we've added a couple goodies uh, that are, are useful uh, for when you're planning to publish your data. The first is that we do circular rotation around the origin of replication for you. Uh, and then we output uh, an annotation for that FASTA file according to NCBI guidelines. So on the SQL system, you can now multiplex 48 microbes per smart cell uh, on, in one smart cell 8M in a single 15 hour run. And so here's the results of the assembly of 48 different microbes that were multiplexed in one run. So the great thing about this is that when you multiply at this level, the per sample cost uh, for the reagents is only $70. Um, and I think most people would agree that uh, that is an affordable price. Uh, each one of these microbes will have 200 or 4-fold higher coverage, which really makes for very robust and very accurate assembly. and makes it such that you don't have to worry about uh, variable loading or small differences in coverage across all of the pooled microbes. And then finally, methylation data is automatically connected during sequencing, and we have verified that the methylation pipeline works well on the SQL2 system and can be used to annotate uh, the bacterial motifs that are found uh, in, in these different bacterial species. And then finally, I will note, um, so this is the number of contigs generated for each one of these species. And, and of course, uh, when you see a one, that's, that's obviously hitting it out of the ballpark, but I will point out that some of these genomes actually have more than one bacterial chromosome. So for example, B. cenocepasia has three chromosomes, so any number smaller than three is of course the wrong answer. Uh, and so all of these assemblies are actually very high quality. So how were we able to improve the robustness of our pipeline? So we're still doing assembly in the same way we always did, by using a seed length cutoff to first assembly, do uh, the assembly using only the very longest reads, and that maximizes chromosomal contiguity. But then we go back and we map all the raw data against that draft assembly, and any reads that don't map, we put in its own bin. And then we attempt to reassemble that bin uh, to recover any plasmids that may be present. In this plasmid assembly stage, there's no seed length cutoff, and we use more relaxed parameters that are, just, that are chosen in order to capture these smaller genomic sequences. Finally, uh, we have added circular wear mapping, and what this does is it allow reads that map to both ends of the draft assembly um, are available to do polishing uh, on both parts of that, of that genome. And this is distinct from uh, our Falcon or HCAP4 pipeline, which uses a linear mapping tool, which is more appropriate for genomes that are, in fact, linear. So circular or mapping, to, to visualize that more clearly, um, enables error correction to happen at both ends of that circular chromosome, whereas with HGAP mapping, you'll see that the coverage drops off here at the one end because those reads are mapping to the other end of the chromosome, and the mapping tool does not realize that it's actually a circular tool a circular chromosome. So all of these improvements mean uh, that we're getting more reliable closure of chromosome and plasmids without you having to change or adjust the settings or, or try different parameters 
or add any Illumina data in order to do error correction. So these are all bacteria that we um, had our customers send in, send in, asking them, send us your bad assembly uh, data, things that wouldn't close that she thought should close, and because we, are, we want to test it out on our new pipeline. And what we found is that all of these sequences that previously did not close are now closing with the circular genome. And these genomes represent a wide range of genome complexity. Uh, in addition, we were able to find uh, complete plasmids from the preponderance of these data sets. Uh, there were some examples where we did not have a complete plasmid. So, for example, in this Bacillus series, uh, the plasmid did come up, but it was not complete. And the reason is because it was linear, and our pipeline assumes that they're circular. So, we have a little bit more homework to do there. Um, in addition, in this case, uh, we did not get the Shigella sun plasmids because there was in fact no coverage in the data. The plasmid, there was just no plasmid sequence in the data. And the reason for that is because with smaller plasmids, there are some issues uh, that remain with optimizing the sample prep. When you go to shear in small plasmids, oftentimes uh, they don't shear because they're super coiled, or they shear, but they shear into pieces that are so small that the size selection used for sequencing will remove these and, they, and the data never makes it onto the instrument. However, there are ways um, to specifically ex extract uh, plasmids and then add them back in to your sequencing. So if you're willing to do those extra steps um, or to modify the default protocol, uh, you should be able to, to capture uh, data from those plasmids as well. So why should this, um, why should this matter for phytobiome researchers? So we have a couple of examples uh, which you might be aware of, of um, great assemblies of, of plant genomes. So this is an example of a genome, uh, Hartmanobacter diazotrophicus, um, that was shown to promote plant growth under salt stress. And these authors noted that draft genomes with low completeness are not reliable for this purpose. Um, they had found already that this plant, uh, or that this microbe was able uh, to have ACC deaminase activity, uh, which is the main mechanism, and it was the main mechanism uh, for um, the bacteria to promote plant growth under stress. So ACC deaminase um, is the precursor to ethylene, which builds up during salt stress. And ACC deaminase uh, shunts this over to an alternative pathway. And so interestingly, with a fully assembled gene, they were able to show that there were no genes uh, that were previously known uh, to do the ACC deaminase in this microbe, but there were eight different uh, coding sequences with uh, that same top domain that were found and that uh, they are now evaluating for activity. And then a second example that you might be aware of is, of course, xanthomonas. So xanthomonas are notoriously hard uh, to close because of the tau effector domains that contain. And these tau proteins have are very repetitive, they have large number of tandem repeats, and there can be many of these tau proteins in a single genome. So back in, in 2015, uh, Bogdanov and Leach, who I understand are both members of the Phytobiome Alliance, uh, developed a modified HGAP3 method to reliably assemble these tau genes, and then to feed those assembled genes back into the assembly pipeline and close xanthomonas genomes. And then what followed, was an enormous wealth of publications uh, sequencing many of these anthemonas genomes and connecting their activity to uh, virulence and also to mechanisms of resistance in plants. So I hope I've persuaded you that PecBio is the gold standard in microbial sequencing, which is something you may have already known, but also that it's an exciting new tool for understanding metagenomes. And with that, I'm going to stop and turn it back over to Kelly. Thank you very much, Meredith. It took me a moment there to find my microphone. Uh, we have a couple of questions <laughs> that have come in. Um, <clears throat> the first one, and you alluded to this during your presentation, but maybe if you could restate it. Uh, from a practical standpoint, what is the difference in output for 16S sequencing for the SQL1 versus SQL2? Yeah, so the difference in output is enormous. So we found with the SQL1, 
uh, there was on order 200,000 to maybe 250,000 um, high quality filtered reads that, that would come off of that platform. And with the SQL 2, we're getting in excess of 2 million, often 2.4 million reads. Uh, and so that really drives down the price point. If you want to have, let's say, uh, 10,000 reads uh, per sample on the SQL 2 instrument, uh, you can multiplex at 48 plex uh, and, and, and get well in excess of that 10,000 reads. And that will cost you in reagents about $27 per sample. And if you multiplex at 96 plex, uh, then in that case, and in that case, you will get on average, um, 20 to 30,000 reads, though some of those barcodes may have as few as 10,000. Um, that will cost you $17 per sample for reagent costs only. Obviously, if you go to a service provider, there will be a markup, and pricing uh, is a little bit different in different um, global regions. So we have another question is, is there any evidence of barcode hopping in the PacBio data? So we have not seen any evidence of barcode hopping. Uh, our barcoding um, strategy, and, and the uh, one of the things in our, that we do in our pipeline is that we have expected barcode pairs. Uh, so our system uh, requires that you tell it whether you're using symmetric or asymmetric barcodes, and it requires that um, the barcodes that appear in the data match a list of expected barcode pairs. And if it does not, those are thrown out as part of the filtering process. Um, so yeah, we do not see um, evidence of barcode hopping um, once things have been processed through the pipeline. Great, uh, this next question is, how does PacBio data compare to Nat Oxford Natapore and more recently developed strand sequencing or strand reading technologies? Yeah, so I would say that the main difference between PacBio and ONT is that PacBio is capable of producing highly accurate reads, whereas ONT requires error correction from with short read technology. So with PacBio, you can use the one technology and get what you need. And with ONT, you have to do assembly in order to get the error correction to do a lot of the types of downstream analysis that, that people are interested in. And then you have to layer in two forms of technology to do assembly. And of course, when you start to layer in multiple forms of technology to do assembly, that becomes increasingly uh, both time consuming and also resource consuming. Um, and then, it, see, I'm not aware of other um, strand reading technologies. I think, you know, from my perspective, I think uh, Nanopore and Bio are the two most accessible options for folks who want to do long read sequencing. Great, and then the last question is, does the microbial assembly pipeline work well with small microbial eukaryotic genomes such as yeast? Yes, it does. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yes, we also uh, ran yeast genomes through the pipeline and got very good results. Uh, we assumed that since we were gonna call it microbial pipeline, people would put all microbes into the pipeline and we wanted to make sure that the results were good and they are indeed very good. Great. So thank you very much. Uh, that's all the questions that we have at this point. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for participating in the webinar. And if you have, just so that you will know, this will be posted on the Phytobiomes Alliance website, which is phytobiomesalliance.org. Uh, it also will be, I believe, on the PacBio website yep. as well. And I'd like to, to thank the Phytobiomes Alliance sponsors and also to let you know that there will be a Phytobiomes conference next December, uh, December the 1st through the 4th in 2020 in Denver. And you can find information about that on the Phytobiomes Alliance website or on phytobiomesconference.org. So with that, I'd thank, like to thank Meredith again for a great presentation and for everyone who has participated. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.